Hello, everybody. Miles Kessler here from the Integral Dojo, and welcome to another in our series of community calls. Uh, this one is on Shu Ha Ri, the traditional three stages of mastery in Aikido. And actually, it's not really in Aikido, it's from Budo, Kobudo, from the traditional uh, martial arts schools of Japan. And really, it's a very natural progression, progressive system that.、Um, Fits very much into anything, any developmental practice, and certainly in, into Aikido. And today, I'm、uh, I want to introduce my my co-host,、uh, Julie Tonlin. Hi, Julie. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. I'm doing great.、Um, thank you for joining me today on this call. Happy to be here. Yeah, you want to say a few reasons why、uh, why I decided to to do this together? Absolutely. So, if you don't know who I am, my name is Julie Tonlin, and I've been training in Aikido for. 20 years、uh, this month, I believe, and、um, I train in Tampa, Tampa Aikido, and I teach there also. And last month, I was invited to teach at a seminar in Orlando, and I chose Shuhari as my topic of teaching. So I led a few classes on,、um, you know, through the the developmental cycle. And for a lot of people in the style that I、uh, train in, it was the first exposure to this methodology. So, some questions arose from that, and it sparked a nice dialogue、uh, and conversation again with Miles on this topic because we've talked about it a few times. And、um, coincidentally, when I was there, there was a Japanese.、Uh, It was the.、Uh, she saw my diagram that I had brought with me, and she told me、uh, she had never heard of shuhari. So, it occurred to me that shuhari is is known in the martial arts world, but I don't think it's actually known in the、um, the world of the everyday Japanese、um, person. So, this is this is a like specified topic, you know,、um, and. It, I just want to, if you if you don't know what this is, I think、um, we're going to have some very interesting、um, conversation about how this applies not just to martial arts practice, if you do martial arts practice, but how it applies to your life and how you can use it in a variety of,、um, like for example, I do music, how you can use it in music or other things in your life. That's great. That's really interesting. I, I wonder if it is applied because、um, you know I lived. I did live in Japan, but it was a long time ago. I know Julie also lived in Japan for for a while, and、um, I wonder if it's if it if the traditional arts like tea ceremony or any, or the craftsmen、uh, have some type of system of shuhari because it's very much related to our Western traditions of apprenticeship. You know, if you think of the guilds back in the day in Europe, you know, when you, if you were if you were going to become a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker when you're a young boy. Or I guess young girl, but probably not.、Um, and back then, it was they send a young boy to to a master baker, and he would sweep the floors for three years and you know learn how to bake the bread or whatever it was. He would go through the system before he became a master craftsman or whatever it was、uh, back in the day. So it's kind of a natural system. It isn't. It is an old school system, but it but it still applies.、Uh, um, even though I think we're going to upgrade it. Um, probably in your dojo, there's several teachers on the call.、Uh, we do some type of upgraded.、Um, you know, Miles, I can add something to that, which、yeah. is、um, I I happen to look at the Wikipedia entry on what shuhari is defined as, and it says that the concept was first presented by a Japanese in、um, a writing called the Tao of Tea. Nice. Oh, I know that book. Which is tea ceremony. Yeah, it's an awesome、yeah. book.、So、it was first introduced. Okay,、uh -huh. I, have, I have some research to do after this call. <laughs> it's a fantastic book, actually. So, okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> All right. So let, let's just let me just do a quick、uh, rundown. So, so、um, what what I want to do in a moment, I want to do a poll. Then I'm going to give an introduction of of shuhari teaching. Then we're going to do a kind of a, a question and answer. We'll go into a breakout so you guys will get to practice and have a little discussion uh, uh, with each other. And then we'll we'll finish off with a few questions and, and some final announcements. But、um, I thought we would do some type of poll here at the beginning, and、um, just to see with the raise of hands, not 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 your visual hand, but the, if you can if you can raise your hand electronically electronically. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a participants button. If you click the participants button, there'll there'll be a way for you to raise your hand electronically. How many people have actually heard of, or it's better to say, how many people? 
uh, are familiar with the teaching method of shuhari. If you could just raise your hand if you are, electronically raise your hand. Maybe if, Julie, if you could count the hands. At this point. Like we've got four people so far and uh, Martin, I think is raising his hand in I front of this, his screen okay. there. Oh, we've right. got a few more now. Yeah, it's interesting. Could, oh yeah, there we go. Six people. Okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. And let, let's just let's just kind of flip that. Um, how many people um, have never heard of it before? Let me just see that. Okay. Cool. So you can lower your hands if mm -hmm. you had raised them. Now we've got three hands up. Four. And if you can't, if you don't know how to do it, or you can't manage to do it on your participants, you can raise your hands just on the screen so we can see you. Mm -hmm. We've got six hands up right now. Okay, cool. Great. All right, you can you guys can lower your hands if you want or uh, I think there might be a way to lower it. Um, yeah, so there are some there are some uh, teachers um, in Aikido that use this system and some teachers have written about it, usually a Japanese teacher, but also some Westerners. Um, and if they do, they probably had some connection with Koryu or the old schools of Budo, Kobudo, uh, uh, Japanese martial, traditional martial arts. It's not used in every system. But um, you'll, you'll come to see, uh, after I kind of give a description of it, that it's really a kind of a natural process. And shuhari is not something, it can be a framework with, within which you work, but it's basically, um, it's basically a very natural progression of development. If, and this is the key, if your development does not become fixated, number one. If your style of Aikido does not become fixated, number two. If your school or your organization is not fixated and or if your teacher, as the case may be, uh, is not fixated. And I don't, I don't mean to say fixated in such a judgmental way. Um, but if like, like I can talk about my school, you know, I, 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 I mean, I started Aikido and Seidokan Aikido, but then after I got my black belt, I moved to Japan and I was practicing Iniwama with Saito Sensei, tra very traditional, old school uh, Aikido. And the main teaching was, was Kihon Waza. It was all about basics. And, and we, you know, we, it was damn good, really strong, solid, really good Aikido, hardcore, you know, coming from America, going there, it was really intense training. And um, we were very proud of it. And, you know, we had a lot of blood, sweat and tears on a daily basis. Um, but, you know, Saito Sensei really felt that his mission, uh, you know, O Sensei had told him to preserve what's going on here in Iwama. So his mission, his life mission was to preserve. And he did that through Kihon Waza, you know, getting people to come back to Kihon Waza and preserve those that, that as, a, as your basic foundation of Aikido. Now, he wasn't stuck there. He was completely free in his, in his expression of Aikido, but he taught there. And the kind of the unconscious culture in the dojo was that you, 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 you do basics. And there was kind of an unconscious uh, glass ceiling where people just, they didn't go, they couldn't evolve above, above that ceiling. So that's what I mean, you know, when, when we're kind of looking at Shuhari, there's a natural progression of development. And Saito Sensei himself had actually developed. And there were a few people in that dojo that I felt had developed beyond that. But there was a kind of a, uh, something had snuck into the culture, like the basics are the most important. And then people tended to get fixated there. So that's what I mean by fixation. So what I want to do today is uh, we're going to kind of look at, look at Shuhari as a natural cycle of, of apprenticeship, you know, that we do have an apprenticeship system in our, in, in, in certainly the European tradition, also in the American tradition, um, Western tradition, I should say. And um, it is a, is a practice, it is a, uh, a cycle of apprenticeship that is a practice of apprenticeship and it is also a practice of mastery. Um, it is a traditional system, so it is an old school system. So modern and postmodern teaching methodologies are quite different and, and different for a reason because they would run into the limitations of the old systems. They upgraded, they had to. So let's kind of keep that into our perspective. You know, we're gonna need a little complexity to kind of hold all this together. Um, it is a system that is embedded, uh, shuhari is a system that is embedded in Japanese culture, which is highly conformist. You know, as Westerners, we are more individualist, sometimes highly individualist, whereas the Japanese culture is highly conformist. So shuhari comes out of that culture, so we need to kind of keep that in, our, in mind. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, shihari is also a reflection of, as I said before, it's a reflection of a natural learning process. Um, and the teachings, at least the first round, the first time you go through shih shihari, it's very much a linear process. You're in stage one, you'll grow into stage two, you'll grow into stage three, hopefully. So that's a line, that's a straight line. It's even a hierarchy. But uh, you'll see later as, uh, as it becomes more of an evolves, or as, your, as your, your experience of this system becomes more mature, it's no longer linear, it's, it's cyclical. It's, a, it's actually a cycle. There's a discovery cycle that's happening through Shuhari all the time. But that's gonna be, I think, as we get into this, the, the third and the fourth uh, call in this series, you'll kind of see that more. And, um, and Shuhari should be practiced. This is my opinion. Otherwise, I think the system is useless. Shuhari should be practiced as an adult developmental system, psychological development. So in other words, as you evolve through these stages, you should be growing as a human being. So if you're a jerk at, at, at the first stage and you get to the third stage and you're still a jerk, something went wrong. Yeah, so that's, that's actually very possible. You know, you can, everybody can make the Darth Vader move and you can be highly skilled, but still be Darth Vader. But then something's wrong in the system. Something's wrong in, in, that, in that system. Because, you know, the, the kind of the Darth Vader move, the Darth Vader, that, that kind of egoistic power, oh, at the expense of other people is, is kind of not so mature. It's immature. And if the, if, if the teaching methodology is allowing you to kind of preserve that as you evolve, then something is going to be out of balance there. Okay. And Shuhari, as I said before, it is a developmental system, but this is one of many developmental systems across all cultures. There's, you know, in Buddhism, they have the Eightfold Noble Path. There's these, the, the, the path of practice unfolds in eight, eight different ways. There's, there's the 16 stages of insight meditation uh, that people develop in, in meditation. There's, uh, there's the seven chakra system. These are all kind of traditional systems. More modern, postmodern uh, systems is like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or, um, uh, Spiral dynamics or integral theory, uh, Bob Keegan's five stages of adult development, um, five stages of tribal leadership and the evolution of response, which is kind of my contribution there. These are all kind of developmental stages. And that's, that's what I, I that's, that's the lens through which I want to use, <clears throat> use to look at Shuhari. So this Shuhari, these three stages of development should be an adult developmental system. I mean, adult, and, and, you know, as opposed to you know, childhood, early childhood development, the way that kids grow up. By the time they become an adult, you know, do they keep growing? So we we want to keep evolving there. And um, <clears throat> Shu Hari, simply put, Shu is uh, conforming to the kata. Kata is the form. Um, it's the conformity stage. Ha is adapting or applying the kata. It's the application stage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And V is transcending the kata. It's the transcendent stage. So these are three kind of stages that you went through. So I'm going to break it down. I'm going to speak to each one of these stages for a few minutes, and then afterwards we'll do some reflective uh, questions and stuff like that. So first, shu. Uh, shu, the, the, the Japanese character for shu is mamoru, is to protect or preserve and it's to conform to the forms of the school. And this is where you conform to the forms of the teacher and you conform to the forms of the tradition. It's quite literally means embracing the kata. You fully go in and you take on the forms of the school. This is the conformity stage. You have to, we all need to become good conformists uh, at this stage. Now, as a Westerner, as an individual, you know, where, where individuality is kind of valued, this can be a tricky thing for people, you know, you go in and suddenly have to bow and everybody has to follow these rules and we have to put our shoes straight and, you know, we, we, we whatever. Now in Japan, that's not a problem. That's what's nice about training in Japan because everybody's doing it. But in the West, usually there's some type of balance between conformity and individuality. So whatever the cultural piece is, what's important at this stage is that what's being taught, you copy, you become a copy machine of exactly what's <clears throat> being taught. And um, you do that in order to build a solid foundation. And um, you know, you think of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You know, in Pisa they have this uh, this tower that's leaning. And you know, I was actually there about you know 20 years ago or something. And it's a beautiful tower. It's really it's really quite a beautiful. But if you start looking at it, you know, as it started to to to, to lean, 
they, as they were putting the stones on the, the, you know, this, instead of putting bricks on each side of the tower that were even, as it started mm -hmm. to lean, the towers on uh, the, the bricks on this side, they would put bigger bricks to try to get it to kind of go back. So it's got all of these compensations built into it. It's still kind of beautiful. But the problem with the tower is not the bricks in the tower. The problem is the foundation. The, the, the earth was not so solid. So the whole point of the shoe stage is actually, is actually to create a very solid foundation from which you can build um, higher uh, in your system. And it is um, very much, the shoe stage is very much a prescriptive practice. So your teacher or the school or the system is prescribing to you what to do and you just do it. You commit at the stage of shoe to, um, to following the teacher. You commit to following the teaching. You commit to following the school and you commit to following the tradition. In the shoe stage, if the teacher says jump, you say, how far? Yeah, you just, you really, you don't, there's no questioning. And any type of questioning at this stage tends to be the ego. This is a very black and white description, yeah? yeah so the, the, just kind of take this with a grain of salt, but any type of um, uh, resistance to conforming at this stage is usually think of younger adults, yeah, is usually a resistance to conforming to what they want you to do. So the ego doesn't want to do it. It's like there's a, there's a gate that you have to pass through and the ego is that's that big and you just can't get through. So you have to kind of, you have to submit a little bit the ego so you can pass through that stage. Stage one, this is early stage of development. Later, you have more freedom in, in how you do the art, but um, traditionally, the, studio, the, the shoe stage was total submission to the teacher. Um, this is where the ego is put second. And um, you could say that the school or the tradition or the practice was put first. Or even in Japan, I mean, they're very good. They're, they have a beautiful tradition of putting other people before you put yourself. So the egos are really kind of, um, what do you say, uh, tamed in that culture. Um, the student needs to uh, perfect the basics of the art. The student needs to perfect the basic forms and there's no room for variation. You know, the foot's like this, the hand's like that, the head's like this, the hair is like that. You don't change anything. You have to do it exactly as the school teaches at this stage. Um, <clears throat> not only is the student expected to conform to the tradition, but the student is also expected to protect and preserve the tradition. So there's a lot of kind of group think that can group thinking that can come into here that can be problematic. But let's just try to look at this a little bit right now as in its pure form, not in its problematic form. Like I said, there's the 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 the, the, the entry gate, the gate to move through this stage is a narrow gate. If the ego or if the individuality is too big to go through there, that has to be reduced so you can pass through. And even though the student will have a solid grounding in the art, um, uh, in, sorry, it will have a solid grounding in the fundamentals of the art, they don't really have so much practical life experience yet. So in other words, they've learned the formula, like you go to school and you study a formula, a mathematical formula, but they've never used that formula to build a bridge. You know, they're good, oh yeah, on, on the board I can do, I've got, a, I've got a board right here. I can do the formulas and work them out and I've got them good in my head in theory. But I've never taken that into life and actually built a bridge with it. So you learn the formulas, but you don't really have the practical experience yet. In the shoe stage, it is very clear just from looking on the outside who your teacher is, what is your style, what is your school, and because you become a photocopy of that teacher and of that school. And you know, when, when I was practicing in Japan, we used to all walk around and, and kind of copy the mannerisms of Saito Sensei, the way he would walk and the way he would talk and the way he would suck his teeth and all the things, the way he would drink beer, we would copy it. And it was kind of fun and cute. And we would often, you know, as foreigners, we'd often kind of make jokes out of it, but we were still copying. And, and you know, if you get stuck there, if it's fixated, it's problematic, but it's really like taking on, you know, you're putting on a suit of clothes to become that, to appropriate what that kata has to offer. Um, you develop, if, and by doing that, you develop, certainly in Aikido, you develop the effectiveness in the art. You know, you've got the ground, you've got the center, you've got the foundation, you've got the extensions, and you've got the technical uh, details that, that work within a very narrow range of form. And there is zero freedom outside of that range. So in other words, I can do my basic techniques, but as soon as somebody changes something, they just don't work anymore. So I have to correct them to do the correct 
you know, again, at this stage, we want to fit. It's like a hand and a glove. You know, if I'm Nage, I have to be the hand. If I'm Ukde, I have to be the glove. And we work on both of those at this stage. Yeah, we're, we're kind of learning forms, which ideally, in a good sense, in the, in the best examples, the forms are an expression of some beautiful principle. We can't see the principle at the shoe stage, but we can see the form. So we practice developing the form. And the techniques at this stage are primary and principles are, are secondary. Not as a choice, but just as a fact. <laughs> because I haven't quite accessed the ability yet to kind of bring the principles online, but I can copy the forms. And that's kind of the shoe stage. And traditionally, the shoe stage Again, if you think of martial arts apprentice back in the day in Japan with samurais, the shoe stage was traditionally somewhere between three to five years. So think about your own dojo, you know, when somebody starts before they can start to do their own thing, they're learning the forms and it's kind of, you know, you training two, two times a week, it'd be, it could be five to seven years, it could be whatever. And uh, I'll, I'll, in a future call, we're gonna talk about how these stages map on to ranking or, or development in Aikido, you know, through the, through the ranks. But, you know, the shoe stage is kind of up to EQ and Shodan, where you're really, you're, because there's a lot to learn in Aikido. So you're just learning those forms and you can get, always get better and better at the basic forms. Now, if you get fixated at the shoe stage, you're going to create a huge shadow. And the shadow of the shoe stage is, is, uh, tends to be an absolutism or a dogma. You know, you, anybody here ever run into dogma in Aikido? Maybe once or twice, I don't know. None of us, of course, not our dojos, not our teachers, not our schools, not our organizations. But those organizations, there's some out there that are, can be dogmatic, absolutistic, and, and um, you know, there's this kind of uh, idea that we're doing it right, they're doing it wrong. Again, this is the shadow. There's this idea that um, we're doing, we're the chosen people. You know, there was O Sensei, there was, there was, there was my teacher, and then there's me, and then there's us. So there's a direct line to, to the truth. And you know, we have to preserve that. And you know, we're doing it right and everybody else is doing wrong. So whenever you hear that, if you've heard that, it tends to be a little bit of either a little bit of a, a kind of leftovers from the shoe stage or, or a massive fixation of the shoe stage. And uh, the sooner you move out of that, the better, because you know, that's, again, if we're looking at this from a developmental psychological point of view, you're drawing a circle around you and your group and you're putting everybody else on the outside. That's not development. Development is your circle should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's shoe. Now, again, that was the shadow and there's a lot of shoe shadow, a lot of shoe shadow out there. But remember, there's something beautiful and good about shoe. So, you know, we have to kind of, our job is to be, is to hold, our le at our level of maturity, we need to be able to hold both of those and kind of separate the wheat from the chaff, as we say, you know, to, to be able to see what's shadow and what's pure and what's good. Now, once you've gone through that, once you've kind of matured through that stage, quite naturally, either you will quite naturally move into that or your teacher will start to push you into the next stage. If the culture, or if the dojo, if the teaching, if the methodology is not holding you back, you're going to naturally move into that or the teacher, your teacher will start to kind of give you a little bit of a kick in the tuchas to move you forward and that's into the next stage. It's called the ha stage, which is to separate. To, it, it means to uh, harareru is to, is to separate or to detach or to break the forms of the school, to break the forms of the teachings and the tradition. Um, quite literally, it means diverging from the kata. And the, the ha stage, excuse me, the ha stage is the application stage. So like I said before, you know, you, you, you learn how to do a mathematical formula now you go out into the world and you build a bridge, you build a, you build a, a building, you build a, you know, whatever you build and you build a, I don't know, a machine with the formula, you know, you learn how to kind of apply that. And that's actually, it's a whole new process. And, um, you know, in this stage, one foot is still firmly in the basics, the foundation, but the other foot is now in this exploration, you know, so there's an exploration and how that looks in Aikido is like, okay, you can do, Yokomanuchi Shihonage, great. Now let's see if you can do it against two people. Let's see if you can about three people. Let's see if you can do it about 
against three people using their left hand and one person using their right hand. One person has a tanto, one person has empty hand, one person has a stick, another person has a, a, a bottle. You start to apply what you know, this is on a technical level, you start to apply what you know into interesting new situations. You go to the beach, you go to the mountain, you go to the stairs. I'm not suggesting that anybody should train like this, but you, you begin to apply into a broader way. You start to see how the technique is not what's being applied. It's the principle at the bottom of the technique translates. So if I'm doing, for example, shihonage in the dojo where it's nice and everybody's wearing clothes and you know, we got mats, then I go to um, uh, a rocky beach and apply it there. It's the technique is not what's gonna make that work. It's the principle. Remember, techniques divide, principles unite. So principles are universal. Principles apply all times, all places, in all circumstances. Techniques in the dojo, a classic technique in the dojo won't work in a real fight. But the principle applies all times, all places, and in all circumstances. In the ha stage, you begin, you hear that? That's thunder over there. That's people training over there. We have a storm going on outside. At the ha stage, you begin to apply the, you, you begin to learn how to apply the different principles, the principles into different situations in the art. Um, and it, you're, there's still a certain, like I said, there's one foot in the, in the foundation of the basics and one foot is in exploration. So there's still a certain amount of prescriptive training, like your teacher will start to say, okay, now do this exercise. Now let's do this exercise. Now let's do this exercise. So half of your training is still prescriptive, but the other half of your training is self-authoring you start to kind of learn how to make it your practice. And um, uh, at this point, the teacher will probably ask the student to move out of the basic forms and start to do some interesting stuff. If it gets too shaky, what do you, if it's just not working, what do you do? You go back to basics. You, know, you go back to basics where it's solid, where it works. You kind of work it out there, then you take it into a new situation. And then you keep, you know, you keep facing, you, you, you allow yourself to be confronted with challenging situations again and again and again to work out the applications. You might do that by visiting seminars. You might do that by visiting different dojos, visiting and training with different teachers, different, different sensei, different styles. Um, you might even do some cross training, you know, in different martial arts. Um, or you might go into meditation, or you might go into coaching, you might, and, and just see how it all applies. Um, traditionally, this was uh, the stage of Musha Shugyo. And when I mean traditionally, I mean, you know, the samurai the, the, in the Kobudo, the old Budo schools, you would, you would do the first stage for three to five years in your school. And then your teacher would say, okay, now you go around and you go to all the dojos around Japan and you challenge the school and see, see how good you are. Musha Shugyo. Musha means uh, uh, no teacher without a teacher. And Shugyo is this astur kind of spiritual trait. You would go around and kind of walk from dojo to dojo. Uh, well, and what's happening at the hostage is you're basically moving into new experiences and uh, you will constantly need to prove yourself again and again and again, to prove your practice again and again, to prove what you've learned again, to prove your school, to prove your tradition. And if, and if, there's, a, if there's a better methodology, you take that on. You start to kind of uh, grow more that way. Um, there's lots of trial and error at the Ha stage. In, in the Shu stage, the trial and error is either you can conform or you can't. But the Ha stage, you're actually beginning to learn how to learn on your own. So there's lots of trial and error. There'll be lots of disappointments. Uh, but there's also a new confidence that is gained within you um, with each win because you're beginning to internalize the practice. Um, the principles slowly or gradually become primary and the forms slowly and gradually become secondary at the first stage at the shoe stage the forms and the techniques and the and and the the, the school that the style is primary and the principles are an expression are expressed through that at the ha stage there's there's a shift that happens a gradual shift where the principles become primary and the and the form follows the principles and because of that, um, the, you know, whenever you're, whatever style you're doing, as you begin to penetrate the principles, the principles automatically begin to affect the form. Automatically. It happens quite automatically. Hopefully you won't have a school that keeps pushing you back into the form. But 
as you touch the principles, the form will start to kind of grow quite naturally. And that's what's happening at the Ha stage. Uh, at the beginning of development, uh, at the beginning, uh, this is the beginning, sorry, this is the beginning of developing, developing your own individual style. Um, but you are still strongly influenced in, in, in the best meaning of the word. You're still strongly influenced by your teacher. You're still strongly influenced by your school, by your tradition, by the art that you're practicing. But you start to kind of make it your own. Um, now, that's the ha stage. Now, the, the shadow of the ha stage, you know, if you become fixated at this stage, the shadow of that is that you are endlessly creating or, or, or practicing wild variations. It's like you start to go broad with variation after variation after variation after variation, after variation, after variation, after variation, and you just kind of get this kind of endless creation of new ways to do things, but still there's no free application yet. There's no freedom. You know, it's, it's, you're still kind of repeating something. So it's in, endlessly broad, but without depths. Yeah, endlessly broad, but without depths. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to kind of, to be in a system that allows you to naturally grow, or if you're even more fortunate to have a teacher who's going to give you a nudge to push you into the next stage, uh, you'll move into the ri, you go from shu to ha to ri. Shu was conforming to the kata, or embracing the kata. Ha is diverging from the kata or applying the practice. It's the application stage. And re is discarding the kata, where it's time to, you know, you, you, you're done with it. And it is the transcending stage. Re is the transcending stage. You transform the forms. You transcend the school. You transcend the teacher. Not that you're going to get better than your teacher. It could happen. But not that you're going to be better than your teacher, but you're just, you're, you're, you're no longer needing, you're no longer dependent or leaning on the teacher and or the tradition. <clears throat> Ri is a natural consequence of the first two stages. Oh, by the way, the first stage is, uh, I said, three to five years, more or less. It's very, very kind of general, but three to five years. The second stage is 10 to 20 years. So if there's anybody in this, uh, on this call who's only doing Aikido for a few years, that's the bad news. <laughs> it takes, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not like bowling, you know. It, it does take some, some time to, to get things done or to, to kind of move through these stages. And this third stage um, is kind of a lifetime. You know, there's no, there's no number put on Ri. So um, it's a natural consequence. Ri is Shu Ha Ri. Ri is a natural consequence of the first two stages. And you move out of the perspective of trait. Uh, sorry, you move completely move out of prescriptive training, and into self-authoring Aikido. This is where I, the Aikido becomes your own. You've completely internalized the forms and are no longer reliant upon them. You know, any form that you're learning, when it's fully internalized, <laughs> any form that you're learning, when it's fully internalized, you don't need the form anymore because you just become a natural expression of the form. At Ri, you have completely internalized the forms, and the principles are now primary, and all forms, all the forms are a natural expression of those principles. You trust in the process, sorry, your trust in the process at this stage is complete. No unsha nothing, it's unshakable, in fact. You are free to be completely creative in your art, and anytime there's shakiness, and you're just like, ah, oh, what do you, you just go back. Anytime it's not working, you're back in the application stage. It's like, wow, you know, I was in the dojo. I was doing all this free creative jiwaza. Techniques were just spontaneously arising. It was beautiful. Then I go train with Don, who's doing another style, and suddenly, uh, wait, it's not working anymore. What's going on? Well, what happened is I'm back in the hot stage. I know I can go back to the basics and, you know, try to make it work, but, but let's be creative. You know, Don's mature Aikido guy and he's got, he does a completely different style. So yeah, let's see where it works together. That's the ha stage again. And then, you know, that, that's kind of how it works. You should, you should naturally move up and down this ladder as needed, but the progression will slowly start to kind of take you up. Um, your creativity will never spoil the art because what you do is a function of Aikido's principles. So, um, creativity is released, uh, completely released at this stage. And it's in it, it, you know, the, the people at Shu, the, the, the first stage might judge you because you're so moving out of what the, 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 the preserving system is doing, but you don't need, you don't need their, um, what do you say? You don't need that. 
you don't need an external authority to to uh, um, validate your Aikido because the principles themselves are the validation uh, and your Aikido at this point becomes totally your own Aikido. You're able to create, you might uh, create new techniques, you might create new practices. If you're teaching, you'll uh, probably start to create uh, new teaching methodologies, just naturally starting to happen. You might even create a new system of teaching, uh, new schools. You think of Osint, you think of all the great masters that have come, that's like, wow, where did this person come from? Look what they're doing. That's all that he stays. They've created something completely new that people start to move into. And the only reason you would adhere to the forms and the katas at this stage is for other people who are at shu or ha, so they can actually climb that ladder in the practice. And you, you see it as, as, as a very functional system to move people through development. Um, you don't need an external authority. So in other words, you're not really answering to anybody else. And um, in a way, you're your own authority. You're, you're able to give yourself your own permission. And as I said before, um, you know, if Shu is three to five years or more, and Ha is 10 to 20 years or more, uh, this stage is a lifetime. You know, it's a life, lifetime of expression. And if there is a shadow, if there is a fixation at this stage, it is usually um, uh, that you're kind of stuck in creativity. So in other words, you, you don't lay down any structures. You don't lay down any forms. You don't lay, lay down any methodologies for other people to move through. You're just doing free art the whole time, free art the whole time, free art the whole time. And sometimes you also see this stage a little bit prematurely. You know, people kind of jump into that stage and they're just doing the creative stuff, but you just feel, you get a sense that the foundation is missing a little bit. And in that sense, it really is, you know, kind of a developmental cycle which we will go into in a lay, later call. So to wrap this up, before we go into questions, to wrap this up, really kind of simple way to look at it, Shu Hari is conforming to the kata. I have a thing here. I'm just gonna share my, my screen for just a moment. Here it is. So you've got Shu Hari. Look at the top here, embracing the kata second level uh, the second stage is applying the kata and the third stage is transcending the kata this is shu hari conformity moving through the narrow gate towards freedom which we'll talk about in a future call shu hari is embracing the kata applying the kata transcending the kata i'm going to send this guys i'm going to send this uh, pdf to you so don't worry about it you will get it okay so with that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, 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 the whole overview of Shuhadi. What we're going to do now is we're going to open it up for a few minutes of, of, of questions, if anybody has any questions or comments or something to add. Um, uh, Julie, you can, you can, um, can you open your mic, Julie? Sure. Yes, Great. sir, if you haven't been on this platform before, there's a couple of different ways you can ask your questions, three different ways. You can raise your hand, like I see Cheryl has her hand raised, and, um, that's the function. If you hit the man, if you hit the participants key at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll be able to see your name on the right upper uh, box. And you can also just manually like raise your hand in your video if you're on video. And the third way is if you hit the chat button at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat column come up on the bottom right, and you can type your question in there, and we'll make sure that those get um, answered as well. There's a lot of people on the call, so uh, we should have some thoughts going on. Uh, maybe Cheryl, I'm sure. going to unmute your mic here. Cheryl, your mic is on. Okay, thanks, Julie. Uh, Hi, Cheryl. Yeah. Hi, Miles. Yeah, th thanks so much for this breakdown. Like, I, I love the clear mapping, and especially the shadow part of each stage um, helps contextualize um, behavior and experiences, right? So it's, yeah. it's really helpful. I, I guess my question, because I'm, I'm just starting Feldenkrais practitioner training, and so mm -hmm. I'm deep into this. As a beginner, how do you engage with complex, this, you know, complex systems? Mm -hmm. and, and I definitely, like, I know I have, you know, I'm only five years into practice uh, for Aikido, but, you know, I know I have this draw to want to mess a little bit with the perfect simple you know striving of new students who want to just it's you know it's this 
and then yeah you can see the dogmatic um, stances like I've I've acquired this so I have to defend this knowledge and like how, that, that's, how, that's, that's from that's from students yeah that's right yeah like you know when white belts come in and uh, you know I, I can see the ego resistance but also I can see the sincere grappling with like what is it you know how do I know I'm doing well you know, this doesn't seem to work because it's a, a training simplification to get a basic, you know, categoring. Um, so I'm just, I'm just curious about like, do you see there any value to sort of leave the li a little upper louver window open that there's more <laughs> right from the get-go just so that they have a sense there's more to the map than here. And when we're choosing this, rather than this is all there is. So you're asking this question as a teacher on how to work with students? Well, just I, I like uh, my only teaching is as a senpai in the in the dojo for um, but I'm just curious about um, I, I see this happen over and over. My background's in education and people yeah. go right to I want to control and acquire the simple truth and mm -hmm. My experience has been I've had to let go of at every belt level the simple truth to a more Absolutely. complex reality. Absolutely. And so Beautiful. Yeah. getting impeded by the simple hard truth that they grasp. Yeah, well, that's a piece of wisdom already. I mean, that's one of the, one of the things that my meditation teacher taught me that he, he, I was having a very challenging point. In my, no, actually, I was having a great experience great time in my meditation practice but I was attached to some pretty uh, far out experiences and he told me hey listen if you want to in order for the new wisdom to come through you got to let go of the old wisdom so he kind of in that moment he, he let it he let it kind of mature in me and then and overdo it and he, he basically let me know in that moment that that um, there's better things to come that what you're doing what you're, where you're at is cool but yeah. and the thing is he could express that he, he embodied that so there was, for me, there was no confusion. It wasn't like I didn't trust him. I, it's like I saw where he was, what he was transmitting in a way. And I just trusted that. I said, okay, yeah, this, this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move out. But he was quite a, you know, he was, he was probably 85 at the time. He'd been a meditation teacher for 50 years and he was, you know, a lineage holder. And it's, so that was a pretty special case. But um, as a teacher, as a senpai or as an instructor, it's helpful to know the stage that you're at. It's helpful to, you know, and so, and, but it's important that you, first that you meet people where they're at, but you don't leave them where they're at. And that's the whole trick of teaching, you know. Now, how do you do that? Well, skillful means, you know, Paya, you have, to, you have to learn the skillful means on how to do that. If you can express it, probably the best. If you can embodiment, it's even better. If you want to use a little cognitive mapping, to help them see, you know, that that's also a way. It depends on the person. And another method, which has nothing to do with shuhari, is you just you kind of get them into the principle. Say, look, let's let's just get into being centered. Let's just get into flow here, and then they start to realize that there's a much bigger stream of, of experience that's happening, and that they're fixating on something. Now, in order to do that with a student, you you have to have some of Authority. I mean, it always comes kind of back. Well, that's that, that's yeah. actually a good place to bring in the comment that we just got from Steve, because he, ta okay. he talks about that directly. Great, great, great. You want to read it? Sure. Steve says, one of the reasons for rankings is to get the students at a lower level to pay attention. Mm -hmm. If a lower rank student tries to teach something to uh, new to a higher rank, it's often dismissed. If a lower rank tries to teach something to a, a new or higher rank, it's often dismissed. Uh, uh, teach, okay. Yeah, teach something uh, new. Yeah. Uh, but but is he talking? Is he talking about the emperor's new clothes, or is he talking about just somebody trying to jump above their belly button? Steve, did you want to expand on your thought there? I don't know if Steve has. Steve, your your mic is open. If you would like to share more, or if you just like to. Um, Write any more, we're open to that. It'll take me too long to write it. <laughs> yeah, I see. are you talking about like the, 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 the emperor's new clothes situation or somebody trying to jump above their belly button? No, it, it's, it's um, I've seen students who are of the same level who 
would have a lot of difficulty showing something new to someone else. Uh, happens in a dojo where three different lineages exist. So there's a find an instructor, one of three instructors. Mine happens to be Saito Sensei. Uh, Let's see. Show you a different Just, way. Uh, hang, hang on a second. Julie, can you turn off Robert Norris's mic? Sorry, Steve. Yeah. They can okay. show you a, a different way of doing things. Um, now, sometimes you'll have a student who technically is of a lower rank, mm -hmm. but they really learned how to do something very, very well. And uh, uh, if that's the case, then the, the instructor who is of the higher rank will acknowledge that, recognize that. Okay. That yeah. So, but uh, but yeah, ranking I think is very important. You're going to pay attention to someone ostensibly because they have a higher rank and they understand something a little bit differently than you do. Well, again, you know, that's all that's called that's all kind of external. You know, that's what it looks like externally. Hey, you know, Julie, for some reason, Robert Norris's mic got frozen here, and um, he's he's like. Yeah. Um, the video is taking over his call. Him. Okay, let's see if it works. Looks like the video got fixed. That got stuck on Robert. Hey, Robert, can you do me a favor and go out and come back in? Sorry to ask, sorry to ask you to do that, but somehow the Zoom got stuck on your. It's a beautiful picture. You got a beautiful face, but it's it's stuck there. <laughs> Miles, as it is, uh, seeing as we're uh, paused. Um, that um, I'm just looking at the clock and wondering if it would be a good time to um, have some chats about this. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. In, so let in me, a let, breakout group. All right, so let me just, you know, we got 10 minutes left. Let me just see if I can, if I can kind of find a simple way to say this. I mean, let's just look at it as an ideal for a moment, Steve, that ideally, you know, the, the, the lower ranking would, would be um, taken care of by the, the higher ranking and things would move through nicely. But when it's, when, but, but it's never that ideal. And this system, you know, that's how it worked kind of naturally, but it's much more complex than that. And the complexity is kind of understood as you go up into higher, higher levels, you'll start to understand more complexity. So um, I think it's better that we just look at it as a simple uh, developmental system and understand that, that you know, yeah, sure. Uh, Cheryl was talking before, Cheryl's obviously um, mature in, other things in her life experience and um and you know so she's going into feldenkrais as a new per as kind of a new person or a new practitioner but she has a lot of maturity that she's bringing with her so she doesn't necessarily start at the bottom you know technically she might start at the bottom but her personal maturity might be at a different level so the the to understand a, a person's inner maturity you already have to kind of be it at ha or the a person at shoe can't determine people that are above them, really. They can't determine if somebody's more or less advanced. A person at ha can understand when somebody's at shoe, but not really ri. And a person at ri kind of gets the whole thing. And even though this, this is like a, a kind of a simple step-by-step -step process, it's really this cycle that keeps going around and we're always returning back to basics. And it is good to have a beginner to come in and say, and you know, poke a, poke a, poke a hole in our technique and show us where it's not working. And that's just another love, that's just another moment of ha. Okay, so uh, with that, Julie, I, what what we want to do is we want to kind of go into a quick breakout session. Uh, we've gone over time. Well, we're kind of beyond our time. We're gonna we're gonna try to stop exactly at seven minutes. So, or at um, at the hour. So why don't we just do like a five minute breakout? And break, well, Julie, if you could set up the breakout rooms, that'd be great. And and simply share with your partner. We'll be in groups of twos. Share with your partner. Um, your, your dojo, your organization, or your teacher, where do you feel they're at? Do you feel that it's more of a shoe teaching, more of a ha teaching, more of a knee teaching, or is it all there? Okay, so you can speak, uh, speak about that in your own experience. Okay, right. we're going into breakout rooms uh, for about five minutes. Here we go. Great, everybody. We'll see you back in five minutes. Have a good breakout. Great, everybody. Welcome back to the main room. I hope that your breakout was short, but no, I know it was short, but I hope it was sweet. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, we're going to go over five minutes today. So if anybody has to leave, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I want to answer a question on the, on the chat. And then Don had a question as well. So first, uh, Mike Frank wrote uh, the basic, basic teaching question. I'm curious how when teaching new students to deal with the idea that some techniques and perhaps even some principles will be more effective for some students than others simply because of the different body types, not just the different body types, but the different level of maturity, um, you know, internal maturity. And yeah, that's, that's all the whole stage. I mean, as a teacher, if you're teaching, you're probably already, you know, your Aikido, let's say your Aikido has already moved through, maybe you're in the cycle of that Shuhari, but once you start teaching, it's all over, you know, we started all over again through this process. And that would be the ha, you know, you, you go in there and you explore, you know, it, there's so many situations, scenarios that we could create to answer that question. But what I'll just simply say is, is that's where you start to apply, you know, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, see what works with some and see what works with others. And my teaching style is completely different than my teacher's teaching style. Even though I do copy his methodology, what I teach is very different than him because I had to apply it to a very different situations. So, uh, uh, Jill, you want to open up Don's mic? Hey, Don. Uh, hey, Miles. Um, I was just, uh, Cheryl, it's great to see you on the call. Um, I, I liked your question. Um, I, I, think what I, I thought what I heard out of that was, you know, how do we inspire even junior students who want to move beyond the basics too quickly, perhaps? And I, I think one way to do that is to show them that the path to, to the, the ha and the re is through the shoe. You can't skip that step. And so that's one thing that I focus on. So that was the quick piece I wanted to add for Cheryl's question, I guess. And then my own thoughts are, that's cool. I, Julie and I have been talking about this a lot because of the class you taught and because of our conversations now between the three of us. Yeah. And, um, and for me, I've been considering that the Shuhari stage goes around three times. Yeah. So Shodan, Nidan, Sandan, Don, Don, go, you know, go down, look down, so so forth. And so for myself, um, being fit Don and having the dojo, I've really come back to the Shu again the second time around and I'm really, really enjoying it because now my understanding of the shoe, of the form, of the, of the principle, or not principle, but the technique, uh, is not for myself, but for my dojo, right? And so nice. it, it has nice. a, I, think, I think I'm getting a different understanding of the same uh, technique because I'm thinking about it uh, in a different way. And yeah, how so, old is your uh, dojo? How old is your dojo? Five, five, years, five years. Okay, cool. So in 10 years, that'll probably be different. In 20 years, that'll even be different, you know. But, uh, right. That, that makes right. Sense. And just as a background, this is my 30th year in Aikido, and I train right. with Aikido schools of Weishiba, for those of you who don't know. And I think right. Satomi should say, you know, certainly teaches a lot in the restage. He yeah. talks about no form and so on and so forth, which for the rest of us is a little bit of a struggle because we want to break that down into some kind of form. So. Right, right. Oh, also, maybe he's just saying, come on, come play with me up here. That's right. And you That's guys right. are the carrot. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Carrot or stick, as the case may be. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Great, Don. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. So, Miles, I just want to note that we are at our time, but I guess we're going to go just a couple minutes over. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. If there's a reason to go over. Did you have a question, Julie? Well, uh, I, well, my question was, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the shadow side of the ha when you were talking about practicing the endless variations and <clears throat> endlessly broad without depth, I was wondering what, what was a concrete example of where we might see somebody that's embodying that shadow side of the ha? Because I would want to know if I was doing that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah so we spoke about this in our breakout, actually. I, I, I think that you know, like maybe a concrete example would be um, highly complex but choreographed Aikido. You know, techniques that are kind of more complicated than they need to be, but they look good, but they're, they're, they're choreographed. So that would be kind of going broad, really keep going broad and broad and broad and broad and broad, but there's no depth. There's still no freedom in that stage. So that would be, and there's nothing wrong with that. At that stage, as a developmental thing, that's really cool, you know, but at some point you got to drop in and go deeper again. So that would be kind of my take on that. And then Morris just asked, do you think it's possible to enter Ha too soon? Yeah, sure. I mean, the thing is, imagine climbing a, imagine climbing a hill, uh, Moritz, and as, as you get up, the path gets narrower and narrower, and your, your, your footing has to become more precise. And if your footing's sloppy, you're just going to slide back down. So if you get in too soon, 
as long as you're with the school or a teacher or a method or you know somebody around you that can help you you're gonna you're gonna keep sliding back and then at a certain point you'll build up enough momentum and foundation to naturally move into the next stage and um, life tends to present us you know life tends to reflect back on us where we're at so you know if I we are honest yeah. sorry to interrupt but um Hans Werner just typed in that he has a question I, I don't know if he would like to use his mic to uh state the question but Hans if you would yeah, like to say your question I'm unmuting your mic now yeah. hey Hans Werner it's hey hi easier to do it uh, this way yeah um yeah my question would be Shuhari, I understand the three stages, but somehow I have the feeling there must be at least a fourth stage or something else because, but I could not qualify it uh, really, but um, I mean, if an average practitioner uh, re reached to re after, let's say 10, to 10 or 20 years of practice, so there are quite some people who will be in mainly in in re in the last stage but among all these people which are in this stage i mean mainly in this stage of course i understand it's a circle and you come back to ha and uh, shu and ha but uh, among those people who are mainly in re there are only very few who create a new martial art so this uh, is an, another evolutionary stage for me. If there is among these uh, restage, there are only very few people who achieve uh, this. So, and yeah, that's why I think there must be something more behind it. Well, is, okay. Is there a question there? I mean, I, I, sorry, his, his mic just got closed. I kind of agree with you, but yeah. did, was there a question there? Well, the question is if you agree with me, and what would be uh, what would be uh, your thinking of how you would qualify this additional stage? If there yeah, is yeah. I mean, it's it, it, to put to put things in three stages is pretty simplistic, to be honest. You know, most like development, like modern, postmodern. Uh, developmental psychology systems have five to eight stages you know that if you look around there they're they're way mm -hmm. more complex than that and then like Don was saying you know we go through the stage two times three times four times in a whole in a lifetime so it really keeps going and and not only do you and I go through it personally but but uh, you've been doing Aikido for a while I've been doing Aikido for a while I look at the Aikido world and the Aikido world is also moving to another stage. You know, it's kind of evolving in some areas In other areas, I think it's regressive. So yeah, it's all kind of complex, but the basic, and I think this is what we're going to talk about next week. The, yeah, uh, no, in two weeks, the basic uh, mark of this development is your capacity to see more complexity, not just see more complexity, but to express and to relate and to function in a more complex way. So what I just said, shu, ha, ri, three stages, it's kind of one dimensional that we're looking at it. There's one stage or second stage, but then it becomes two dimensional, then it becomes three, then it becomes multi-dimensional or multi-perspectival. You know, you know a, a, a fractal, Hans Warner? Mm -hmm. the, the fractal? Yeah, yeah. You go in and it's like a whole nother fractal and you go in and it's a whole nother, it, it's really like that. It's endless. There is no end to it. And you know, that, that's where, and, and we just keep doing that by putting one foot in front of the other and you know, moving forward in the practice. Mm -hmm. But I'm in on my terms of, time. yeah, go ahead. Okay. No, no, yeah, I see this. Well, what I would suggest for this fourth stage is somehow the one, the master who creates a new martial art, yeah. or what he's doing finally, he creates a whole new set of shoe. Of forms. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I would then, say uh, I would then, say he creates something new, but in order to teach it, you have to give shoe to people. You have to give the forms to people. Yeah, yeah. But what he's doing is that's not the same shoe he has learned. Not at it's all. It's a new shoe. I agree. <laughs> it's yeah, it's a new shoe. <laughs> the shoe is on the other. <laughs> it, it could be that you gain the wisdom to understand the shoe and see why it exists in the first place. Maybe it doesn't have to be shoe. 
change. It, 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 you know, wow, exactly. This really yeah, is the best yeah, way. You know? yeah, yeah. That's you, the you brilliance, can, right? You can still preserve, like in Buddhism, they say there's a boat that crosses the stream to the other shore. You can still you can still use the same boat, the same vehicle, the same methodology to get people to the other shore, but you'll be doing it in a completely different way. Or you might in, in, in invent or create a better boat. Mm -hmm. Depends. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, so Julie, I think that's it for today. All right, I think um, uh, Mike Frank wanted to relate a, uh, an anecdote that's very short that uh, was inspired by a comment that you made, if I can share that before we break. Please, please. Um, uh, he said uh, a native Japanese speaker once translated uh, carrot and stick as candy and beating. <laughs> so um, I, I suppose he's relating that to the... the, leave, it, leave, it to the leave it to the Japanese to translate English. <laughs> yeah. <Great it> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, Robert. Robert says, thank you, I need to go. Thanks a lot, Robert. I know everybody, we've gone over 10 minutes. That's great. I just have a few uh, announcements here to make at the very end. Uh, our, uh, so remember, these are four calls. The first one today was uh, Shuhadi, kind of with a ladder of development. Uh, our next call will be on um, Shuhadi conformity versus freedom. The third call will be on the stages, um, of, uh, the stages of Aikido from simple to complex. And the fourth call will be on the developmental cycle. Um, uh, next, uh, our next meeting is gonna be in three weeks. It's on Wednesday, January the 23rd. You will get an email about that for, uh, 24 hours and, and two hours before the call. So don't worry about that. Um, this call has been recorded. I'll have it up line. I'll send, I'll have it online within, let's say 48 hours. And I'll send you guys a mail. Um, please share it around, play, share the event around. These are free for everybody. So bring them on. Um, I'm doing this, uh, this series of, of calls on Shuhari because I'm teaching a winter Aikido camp here in Tel Aviv, Israel uh, on um, yeah, March 4th to the 9th. And the whole five day camp is gonna be on Shuhari. We're gonna kind of practice the, through these stages. And um, you, let me just, I'll, I'll send you guys the link right here in the chat window, just a moment. There we go. That's the link, you can check that out. Um, if you're interested in coming, I know some people more is, is gonna be joining, Samith is gonna be joining us. If there's somebody on this call that would like to come join us, uh, you have a, there's an early bird discount until January 31st, you can save 50 euros. So uh, be sure to sign up until then. And like I said, this has been recorded and it will be posted online soon. You'll get a mail. With that, I want to thank uh, Julie for helping me out. Uh, she's agreed to help me with all of these calls. And uh, with that, I want to say everybody, thanks for joining. And I wish for you a happy new year. And may 2019 be a practice, uh, be a year of, of practicing Shu, practicing Ha, and practicing Li. And whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, may your practice continue to lead you forward, forever and always forward. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Miles. I'm going to unmute all the mics here. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Good evening, wherever you may be.